Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful local products we enjoy. A local farmer's market is credited with restoring downtown business. We'll tell you their story. Garden season is finally here and we have tips on how to prepare your soil. And a few Virginia farmers are recycling an unusual product as cattle feed. Hello everyone, we are here in Amelia County at a beef cattle operation, a beautiful farm. And a few miles down the road, we're gonna tell you a story about a cattle feeding operation that is quite unique. But first, we're gonna talk about the Roanoke City Market. City officials there credit that farmer's market with revitalizing the city center. 10 years ago, city officials say downtown Roanoke was home to 11 residents. Now 1,200 people call this historic area home, and part of the reason for the rebirth and interest in the area is the historic city market and the local farmers who sell here almost every day of the week. This market started in 1882, um, right across the street from us at the city market building. All the mar uh, farmers would pull up uh, for the day, probably about four in the morning, and sell all of their stuff until it was gone. And eventually it moved over to this side of the street um, in the early teens. And in the early 90s, um, you know, they redid the market and then it just rejuvenated uh, downtown business. So we have plenty of locally owned restaurants and shops, and that's all because of this market. The market wasn't always busy. In fact, many residents outside Market Street wouldn't come downtown years ago. But efforts by city officials and farmers that supported the market helped bring residents back to the heart of the city. I think a farmer's market creates a place of community where people can come. And when you have that, people tend to flock to that and then they stay downtown and shop and, and eat. So I definitely think farmer's market is a way to, um, to get your downtown the, e the economy going again. At the peak of market season, 30 to 50 vendors from farmers to artisans call this city block their home away from home. Some have been selling their produce here their entire lives. I used to come down with my mom and grandma. Um, my mom they used to sell eggs down here, so I would come down in the little the baby carrier uh, when I was just a baby. So I, this is my, basically at my second home. Now I can remember when it used to be a little shady, but it's all good. I mean. Um, you know, you got the, the country charm and what they've done to this downtown area here and all the restaurants that you have down here and the retail. Uh, it's a great atmosphere down here on, on the market. Farmers like Woods have developed relationships over the years with customers that visit his stand. It is the accountability and respect for the area that has brought customers back for more, like Don Erdman, who moved to the Roanoke area more than 20 years ago. Since then, um, a lot of things have come downtown virtually because of all this and uh, with our trying to eat healthier and so forth, uh, we look for the local farmers to get produce and this is a one-stop shopping. I don't think we'd see as much coming downtown without the market area. Uh, there are numerous restaurants, there's a lot of downtown living now and I think that has a big is a big result of what the farm market has done. Today the market offers herbs, flowers, fruits, vegetables, vegetable plants, meats, and fresh eggs. Local artisans also sell their creations at the market. It is open year-round seven days a week and closes only on Christmas and New Year's Day. We really haven't had that slump that everyone else has. We've been very fortunate you know and that is mostly due to the market and um, also our residents willing to come down here and shop and support us. So. I, I believe that it, it not only saved, but it made Roanoke. Plans are underway to renovate Market Square to focus more attention on local producers and their fresh food items. Construction begins in 2014. For more information, go to downtownroanoke.org. Reporting in Roanoke, I'm Sherry McKinney. Roanoke, the star city of the South, is surrounded by 345 farms in Roanoke County. 
Most of the farms in this mountainous county are small, 85 acres or so. The largest farm commodity is cattle and calves, followed by nursery and greenhouse products. Roanoke County farmers also raise fresh market vegetables, milk, poultry, eggs, and hay. 69 farms have ponies, horses, or donkeys on them, and 81 of them produce milk products. Apples and other fruit products are also popular crops in Roanoke County, Virginia. Hi, I'm Mark Viet. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about what you can do to prepare your soil for planting. Stay with us. Well, we're on our farm here in Virginia in Augusta County. We have been here since 1954. We moved here, my dad did. And since then, I've had my two sons and daughter and son-in-law, they're here. I've got grandchildren, so it's a fourth generation here that's on this farm right now. We really feel blessed that all of our family is a part of this farm. They could have chosen different routes. Well, it's a wonderful place to grow up and have a family, and it's, it's, we can all work together and play together. I know there's a lot of families you now that go to work, and you don't see them until that night, whereas with the farm here, we see each other all day long. It's a wonderful place to grow up and live. Being out here in nature and, and watching things grow, and, and just days like today that's a beautiful day, you, you just feel very fortunate. I'm Dan Holsinger. I'm dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my land. The warm weather is finally here and gardeners all over the place are itching to start digging in the dirt. And Mark Viet shows us today how to prep your soil in the garden. When plants die in your garden, what do we all do? We blame ourselves. I have to tell you. It's not your fault if plants die in a garden. What I find is many of us are dealing with imperfect soils, heavy wet soils, clay soils, or soils that have been compacted by bulldozers, heavy equipment, to the density that's harder or thicker than concrete. And so our plants don't thrive. But there are a lot of things that we can do to improve our soils. If you have poor soils, Within three years, you can have a perfect environment that will help your plants grow year after year after year. Be it trees, shrubs, flower gardens, annuals, or vegetables, there are a couple easy steps that you can do right in the beginning that'll ensure your success. I always like to have a nice, loose soil. So let's look at some of these things that will give you that environment for your plants. Have you ever heard a $10 hole for a $2 plant? Well, there's a reason for that saying. It's really important that you prepare the soil even before you think about what kind of plant goes where, because that's the most important factor. A lot of us are dealt with a given soil like this, which, you know, these make great mud balls. You know, they don't crumble. They make nice round balls, and if you actually threw this against the a block building, it would stick to it. That really isn't healthy for a plant environment. What you really want is soil that crumbles, and when you work the soil, it's important that it's not too wet. Because once you do work your soils and you compact them, it could take five years or longer for air and water to penetrate that hard pan that you created within your garden. We have taken all the soils around the home that were like this, heavy clay, in some areas very red clay. You really had a hard time digging. And we have made those soils now look like this. And there's a couple things that you can do. You can add compost, you can add organic fertilizers, and you're also gonna have to get a workout. Watch this. Are you ready for your workout? It's this simple. Just take organic matter, and if you have your own compost pile, that's great. I suggest about two inches of organic matter over an area that you're planting. In addition to that, use an organic fertilizer like Plantone. Always read the label directions. I also like to use a mineralizer like green sand. And the term double dig is you're gonna dig it twice. By putting it on first, I'm gonna mix it in by doing this and you just work the soil. Two times, then you're gonna go deeper. 
and you can see some of that clay coming up. And I'm digging down to about 10 to 12 inches deep, probably deeper than a rototiller. Once you're done, you're ready to plant and enjoy your flowers, trees, shrubs, or vegetables for many years to come. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Up next on Real Virginia, we'll show you how to make a terrific recipe to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. That recipe is coming up in the heart of the home. All-terrain vehicles are a lot of fun and have become very popular in rural Virginia. An ATV is versatile and is used for a variety of purposes. But it's important to never carry a passenger unless the ATV is specifically designed to carry riders. An extra rider can distract the driver and throw the ATV off balance. Operate your ATV safely. And remember, no extra riders. For more on all-terrain vehicle safety, go to FarmBureauAdvantage.com. I love, we love, I love, we love, I love the scenery at Virginia State Parks. I love the water at Virginia State Parks. We love hiking in Virginia State Parks. I love history in Virginia State Parks. We love camping at Virginia State Parks. I love Virginia State Parks. I'm Bob McDonald and I love Virginia State Parks. Find something you love in a Virginia State Park. May means beautiful flowers, gardens in bloom, and of course, Cinco de Mayo. Today, Kendra Bailey Morris brings us a great recipe for carne asada in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Kendra Bailey Morris, and welcome to the heart of the home. We're here in Sir Latab's kitchen, and today we're going to be working with Virginia beef. And what we're going to be making today is a carne asada with a roasted tomato and pineapple salsa. And it's really, really kind of sweet and a little bit hot. Uh, and we're gonna actually make these into tacos with um, fresh corn tortillas. So to get started, I have a nice piece of flank steak. And the flank steak, um, we're gonna go ahead and just do a basic marinade. And I'm gonna start with some vegetable oil. And I also call this recipe borracho style. And borracho basically means drunk. So this is our, our, our booze that will go in there. It's a little bit of Mexican beer. And of course, while Mexican beer is really delicious, you could certainly uh, use a Virginia beer. Virginia has some wonderful breweries all over the state, so I encourage you to check them out. And then I've got some chili powder, some cumin, got a little bit of cider vinegar, some brown sugar, in there and then we're going to add some lime and it's also you would need to be real careful when you're marinating meat um, in lime because a lot of times you can kind of end up with something that resembles ceviche because lime any form of acid lime lemon whatever will cook the meat so we're only going to marinate this for about an hour as a result so I'm putting a, about a whole small lime in here there we go and I've got some garlic and some fresh cilantro, fresh chopped cilantro. And all I'm gonna do here is mix this all together real nicely. And I'm going to add my meat. And you obviously wanna coat it really well. And this is gonna go into the fridge for about an hour. Now we're gonna be doing the roasted tomato and pineapple salsa. And why pineapples aren't native to Virginia, tomatoes are and this is a really unique salsa because we're not just going to chop the tomatoes and put them in the salsa we're going to roast them in an oven at 400 degrees for about um, 30 to 40 minutes until the skin on them blisters and I just sliced this uh, tomato long ways and I'm putting it skin side down because we want to keep all those precious juices in there and then I've got a serrano pepper as well. And uh, peppers obviously are native to Virginia as well. You can grow them in your own backyard and serrano peppers do particularly well. You could substitute a jalapeno if you wanted to as well. So I'm just gonna put these as is in the oven at 400 degrees and it's gonna roast for about 30 to 45 minutes. Meanwhile, I've got my steak ready to go. And I'm just gonna do this on a grill pan. Certainly you could do this on an outdoor grill, it'd be really, really nice, or you could do it on a pan inside. And this steak is ready to go. 
I'm just going to lightly season it with a little bit of salt. And whenever you're seasoning steak or anything that you're going to put on the grill, it's always a good idea to salt it just before it goes onto the grill and not salt it ahead of time. Because when you're working with really great beef, fresh beef, as, such as Virginia beef, you don't want it to over uh, make it tough. And the salt can actually make the meat tough if you let it marinate in salt. So this is going on the grill. And this is what I'm going to add a little bit more fresh salt and some freshly ground black pepper. Set this aside. And this is going to cook for um, about two to three minutes on each side. Um, this is, a, like I mentioned, a flank steak. And so rare is better. You don't want to overcook this particular cut of meat because it has very, it's very, very tender. So we're just going to give it a good sear on each side. And we're going to take it out and we're going to let it rest. And then we're going to carry on and make our tacos from this with our roasted salsa. So we'll be right back. Virginia beef is one of the top farming commodities in the state of Virginia, producing over $550 million per year. So our salsa has finished roasting in the oven, or should I say our tomatoes and our roasted serrano pepper. And what I've done is peeled the peel off of the tomato. It comes off really easy after you've roasted it for a while. And I've done the same thing with this serrano pepper. And so what I'm doing now is just chopping the tomatoes. And what I've got in a bowl here already is some diced pineapple and some diced onion. And I'm going to add this mixture to my pineapple. So again, you've kind of got that hot and sweet. And the serrano pepper packs a pretty good punch. So you want to be aware of that. And I'm just going to scrape this in. Because you want to get all those juices in there, too. You slide this whole kitten caboodle into the bowl. And now I'm going to add a little cilantro, fresh cilantro. You can add that to taste. And some fresh squeezed lime juice. And finally, a little bit of black pepper. And a small pinch of salt. And that's all there is to it. You could actually make this a day or two ahead. The longer you keep it in the fridge, the more the flavors are going to come together. And it's going to just get better and better and better. So this is done. Meanwhile, I've gone ahead and taken my steak off the grill. And I've started to slice a couple of pieces here. And you can see it's nice and rare inside, which is what you want with this particular cut of meat. And we're going to go ahead and assemble our taco. I've got some salsa here already done. And I'm using corn tortillas for this. You could use flour tortillas if you wanted to. I just like the way the corn tortillas do in this particular dish. And I just go ahead and steam them in tin foil, um, wrap them in tin foil, and then stick them in the oven. That's all there is to it. And so I'm just going to put a couple of pieces of steak inside. A little bit of salsa. And finally, just a little extra minced onion, optional, but recommended. It's a very, very simple dish. You see there's no cheese, there's no sour cream, none of that stuff. This is very traditional Mexican style cooking. And there you have it. We have a grilled carne asada with a roasted tomato and roasted serrano pineapple salsa. I'm Kendra Bailey Morris. Let's get cooking. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. Nearly nine out of every U.S. households, about 88%, will eat beef at home in the next two weeks. Steak, eaten plain, is the single most popular beef dish. It's eaten more than once a month by the average American. The U.S. beef industry is made up of more than one million businesses, farmers and ranchers, operating in all 50 states. In 2011, Virginia beef production was responsible for more than $373 million in cash receipts. Virginia ranks 16th in the number of cattle and calves in the country. The top beef producing county in Virginia is Augusta County. Last year, North American gardeners donated over 1.4 million pounds of food to feed the hungry. 
That's over a million meals that a government agency won't have to provide. It's so easy to plan a row to feed the hungry. Unfortunately, it's also easy to find an organization or an individual that needs that extra food. Thank you very much. Won't you please join the Garden Writers of America and your fellow gardeners and plan an extra row in your garden to feed the hungry? It's so easy. Spring rains carry excess lawn fertilizer through our sewers and rivers to the Chesapeake Bay, where the blue crab harvest has been extremely low. So skip the fertilizer until fall, because once they're gone, what's left to enjoy? Many times cattle will feed on pasture land and grain to get to market size. But for some farmers, they're feeding a unique blend of feed made from recycled beer mash. Patrick Dunn has more from Nelson County. Who knew that craft beer production would be good for a cow-calf operation? It's the beer's key ingredient, the mash, that's a real game changer for Massey and Joyce Saunders' Roseland Farm. The spent mash they acquire from Taylor Smack's Blue Mountain Barrel House Brewery is a fantastic food supplement for their growing herd. When I was talking with Taylor, he was trying to figure out how he could get rid of his grain at the least amount of expense for himself. And we got to talking and I said, well, I think I can supply you containers where you can make it easy for you to fill it and easy for you to get them out of your place. And then I can find a way to get rid of it with my cattle. And it's just been a win-win for both of us. Casey Smith operates his own natural beef operation and shares the brewer's grain with the Saunders. He knows that there's a good reason the mash is so effective. We feed the brewer's grain because it's a cost-effective protein supplement that's readily available to us. Protein is a critical component uh, of the diet in the rumen of the cattle. It has tremendous effects with the cattle beyond nutrition. Me personally, with my farm, the largest gains I've seen with feeding the brewer's grain have been with reproductive efficiency, uh, higher breeding rates and shorter time intervals, which translates into more dollars in the end. And Alvin Tolliver, who manages the Saunders farm on a day-to-day -day basis, is also convinced the cattle are benefiting from this protein-rich supplement. Since we've been feeding them in the mash, they have good calves, but the calves grow good. Mama cows milk good. For the past two years, the Saunders have been providing a natural beef product for the local market. Massey says the grain is definitely making a difference in flavor. We're getting good marble on the meat. We're getting good ribeyes. We're getting good steaks out of them. And the hamburger is superb. And when you cook it, it just falls apart. I can see a big difference. The people we are supplying with that beef see a big difference. And most of our people are repeat customers and they're saying, we will not buy beef in the grocery store anymore. Saunders is thrilled with this local cooperative. He and Smith believe recycling the spent beer mash through their herds have helped to make their cattle calm, healthy, and easy to handle. But perhaps Joyce Saunders sums it up best. We have happy cows. <laughs> And that makes for happy customers at both the steak and ale ends of this unique farming arrangement. Reporting in Roseland, Virginia, I'm Patrick Dunn. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We're so glad you could join us to enjoy the bounty Virginia has to offer, whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape. We are proud to say this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good month. Chesapeake Bay.